so dark. In the beginning, it is always dark. What is that? One grain of sand. It is all that remains of my vast empire. And my first wish is The idea of nothingness touches the core of fundamental issues in philosophical thinking. Can nothing exist? Was there a nothing before there was something? Can something come out of nothing? And can something become nothing? This is a mind-boggling concept one can reflect on in depth. Despite its conceptual challenges, film has not shied away from dealing with the idea of nothingness. Alfred Hitchcock made frequent use of MacGuffins, when narrative goals or objects play a role in the story of the film without any causal explanation. In Hitchcock's own words, it's the thing that the characters on the screen worry about, but the audience doesn't care. In Psycho, for instance, the MacGuffin is the cash that Lila Crane steals from her boss. The money serves to introduce a concern in her character, with no offered causal or motivational explanation for viewers as to why she stole the money. The object or goal that makes up a MacGuffin is not important to the plot. Rather, its importance is in how it shapes a viewer's perception of the character. A MacGuffin is then an element of nothingness, imprinting a sense of urgency and thrill in a film. Her sister's going to do that. She's as worried as we are. Nothingness has also been used in film as an element of existential concern. Much of European art, modernist cinema, and the so-called slow cinema have an aura of nothingness. By removing standard narrative expectations and unplugging story elements from the screen, the films of Bella Tarr, Michelangelo Antonioni, Andrei Tarkovsky, and so many others deal with the idea of nothingness as their core existential inquiry. Nothingness is less common in a children's film. However, The NeverEnding Story is an exception. Directed by Wolfgang Peterson in 1984, the film's dealings with nothingness is a possibly what makes it so appealing to adults alike. The film is full of narrative appeal, excitement, and powerful emotional experiences while being centered on the idea of nothingness. Even though we never see the nothing in the film, we see its effects. We see a world heading to destruction and inexistence. Contrary to much of slow cinema, where nothing is a pervasive layer and the characters seem to be wrapped around its mantle of powerlessness, the nothing is clearly identified by the characters in the never-ending story. The film deals with nothingness as a philosophical and narrative concept, showing that nothingness can be dealt with in its existential plenitude at the same time that it can be fully intelligible as a narrative element. The film materializes nothingness in the form of experiential metaphors. Experiential, in this case, means that they can be not only visual and auditory, but can cover a range of sensory experiences and emotions. In film studies, metaphors have traditionally been approached as verbal or visual metaphors, typically in the form of visual superimposition. However, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson redefined and proposed that a metaphor is a matter of thought and action a physical embodied matter. This became known as the conceptual metaphor theory and led us to understand metaphors not only as figures of speech, but as forms of experience in our everyday lives. I approach cinematic metaphors in the sense offered by Lakoff and Johnson. I believe that even though film is an audiovisual medium, our experience of that engages more senses than just sight and hearing. The never-ending story lays out a complex map of experiential metaphors related to the concept of nothingness, which makes the concept a matter of experientiality rather than mere thought decoding. The never-ending story offers a radical proposition, that meaning is not just the result of putting together the narrative pieces, but is embedded in the sensory experience of the film. Although the film is fantasy in genre, the world in the never-ending story is not far removed from our real lives and from the physicality and physiology of our bodies. We watch several characters as they eat, sleep, and itch. Eating and sleeping are primordial needs, and they serve as reminders that these are real characters, even if fantastic. They get sleepy, tired, and hungry. 
get round and scratch behind my right ear. These elements enforce a basic relatable connection between the viewers and the characters. But how does sensory experience reflect meaning in life? The nothing in the film is a threat to our own existence and ultimately leads to the destruction of matter and to the absence of sensory experience. Sensory experience is, then, a reminder that nothingness hasn't defeated us yet. Although it seems a paradox, the nothing is an experience of existence and emptiness. The nothing is absolute lack of meaning. Thus, the mere existence of matter and sensory experience reflect meaning even if they imply pain and sadness. In his quest to defeat the nothing, Atreyu defies the natural elements, the wind, and the clouds, the heat of the desert, the cold of a snow blizzard, the harsh topography of the mountains, the engulfing wetness of the swamps. Enduring these severe sensory experiences is part of Atreyu's battle against the nothing. Later on, the swamps raise the bar of adversity and heightens the heroicity of his actions. The enveloping hapticity of the swamps gives meaning to Atreyu's life by making him a hero as he struggles to move through the swamp. At one point, he loses his horse companion and now has to resume alone in his quest. Artax, you're sinking! Come on, turn around! You have to now! As a metaphor, this transfers meaning from the harshness of the sensory experience and the losses we experience in life to the idea that we need to keep sight of the ultimate goal in our own quests. Here we have a fundamental role of metaphors, the transfer of meaning from a source to a target domain. You have to care for me. You're my friend. I love you. The testimonies of film viewers illustrate the idea of meaning as sensory experience better than anything else. I reviewed dozens of viewers on IMDb who report how growing up they would watch the film over and over again with the same relentless excitement. Although I was only a year old when The NeverEnding Story first came out, I remember watching it over and over as a little girl. My grandma got it for me when I was little, and I remember making her watch it with me almost every day, sometimes two or three times in the same day. This is a beautiful film. It enthralled me as a child and still does as an adult. I've watched it over and over again, never tiring of it, and always enjoying it. This movie is still one of my all-time favorites from when I was a little kid playing with my toys in front of the television. This is a movie that I've watched over and over again a million times and never get bored with. To this day, I still watch it and still enjoy it just as much as when I was a kid playing it on my VHS player. The Never Ending Story offers more than a fairy tale story with a static map of meaning. Instead, the film proposes that meaning is inextricable from the ever exciting appeal of experiential metaphors that are renewed at every stage of our lives. In other words, sensory experience renews the film's capacity to offer meaning as we deal with the fear of nothingness through stages of our lives. Another radical proposition of the film is that the viewer is not a mere observer or even an active interpreter of the film but is in fact part of the film itself. Although the film technically exists without a viewer, the film needs the viewer in order to truly exist according to its purpose. Understanding this, the film and the viewer have a unique relationship. The film is the film viewer. Look, your books are safe. By your reading them, you get to become Tarzan or Robinson Crusoe. But that's what I like about him. Ah, uh -huh, but afterwards you get to be a little boy again. What? Well, what do you mean? Listen. Have you ever been Captain Nemo? Trapped inside your submarine while the giant squid is attacking you? Yes. Weren't you afraid you couldn't escape? But it's only a story. That's what I'm talking about. The ones you read are safe. 
The bookseller's words imply that the never-ending story is so powerful that it will alter us radically. At a fundamental level, he is referring to a concept of story based on decoding verbal meanings versus a concept of story based on experience that can change someone. He has to give me a new name. The film is the viewer, moves away from the idea that there is subject, the viewer, and an external object, the film, and proposes that the film and the viewer meet in a shared ontological space. It's only a story. It's not real. It's only a story. In one scene in The NeverEnding Story, Bastion's screams echoes through the story world and Atreyu hears it, making it a unique case of disillusion of boundaries between diegetic and non-diegetic sounds. It seems as if the story is happening inside Bastion's mind, even though the signs of the story are in an external object, the book. Something similar happens at a visual level when, closer to the climax of the film, Bastion and Atreyu are visually superimposed, a threshold of layers in the Mizuna beam. Most importantly, it also represents the metaphor that the film is the viewer. For someone with an understanding of film in an externalized way, it might be difficult to conceive that the film and the viewer can be the same since they are separate entities. However, data, be it a digital code or the impressions of light on celluloid, is just data and is nothingness by itself. Just as the viewer needs the film, the film needs the viewer. Only when it comes to life through the experience of the viewer does data become a film. If conceived as an experience, however, it becomes easier to conceive that the film is the viewer. The characters in a film have no existence outside the experience of a viewer, who animates the data of the medium in a phenomenological way. By implicating that a film shouldn't be just a chain of actions, causes, and consequences in a narrative logic, but a sensory experience full of meaning. The film is the viewer implies that film needs to be created with deep knowledge and sensibility of human nature. Not just knowledge of human thought, but knowledge of human physiology and sensory perception. An important reading of the idea that the film is the viewer applies specifically to this being a film aimed at an audience of children. The film empowers children as it invites them to be part of the film, but it does something else too. Young children can have a weaker awareness of the boundaries of fictions and reality. The metaphor might push that confusion a bit further. Even though the world of Fantasia is unrealistic, the sensory experience of the film makes it real. Vittorio Galese and Michelle Guerra have written an essay with an excellent discussion on the idea that watching a film is a matter of embodied simulation, which resonates closely to the idea I am looking at here. The meanings of a film are conveyed through sensory experience and transferred to the viewer by means of a metaphor that says that the film is the viewer. Embodied simulation, as Galese and Guerra call it, implies that film is not merely a representation of signifiers or codes, but an experiential simulation that physically engages our brains and bodies through our emotions, actions, and the senses. Galese and Guerra offer a convincing review of film scholarship that shows an overlap between our experiences of the natural world and the experiences of the film. It may be difficult to conceive that we experience the world of a film story in a physical way when film is an external object, 
But film is a medium. It is, in fact, a bridge between cinematic data and our experiences. By itself, it's just meaningless, dead data. Silver mountains, the desert of shattered hopes, and the crystal towers. If we conceive the idea that the film is the viewer, it becomes easier to accept that our experience of a film is embodied, experiential, physical, and not imagined. As Galese and Gera mention, the continuity between the film and the viewer creates an impression that we are inside the diegetic world, that we experience the movie from a sensory motor perspective, and that we behave as if we are experiencing a real-life situation. So does the never-ending story.